What is ADHD? How does ADHD medication work? And how you can fix ADHD rage? These are just some of the questions I ask a doctor in this week's episode. If you find ADHD chatter useful, please click follow on whatever platform you listen to it on, or if it's on YouTube, please click subscribe. Enjoy the episode. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Chatter. This week, we are very lucky to be joined by Dr. Yanina, who has a PhD in clinical psychology, is an ADHD and executive functioning coach, empowering people with ADHD to better understand their unique brains and live a fulfilling life. Dr. Yanina, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on here. I'm super excited because I've been looking forward to getting a doctor on the show to ask the question. I guess it's a, it's a very basic question, but what is ADHD? Mm -hmm. So first, ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, which I feel like is kind of the wrong word because often we pay way too much attention to way too many things. But in general, people with ADHD just struggle with attention or regulating their attention and in general, just executive functioning skills. So we have a hard time regulating, organizing, time management, regulating our emotions and just anything that accounts to the executive functioning skills. Gosh, it sounds like um, I'm thinking, how do you know me so well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, are there different types of ADHD? So there are three different types of ADHD. There is the hyperactive impulsive type, which I think is still the most common type. It's kind of when we picture this ADHD boy running around the classroom, <laughs> making the teacher mad. Um, but then there are also two other types. There is the inattentive type that is often also labeled as the daydreamer. They're often missed because they don't cause any like trouble in class because uh, they're usually just daydreaming and they're kind of living in their own world. And then the third uh, subtype is the combined type. So they have hyperactive and impulsive symptoms, but then also these inattentive symptoms. Looking back into your own earlier years and your own childhood with this, I imagine, quite vast knowledge that you have now around the topic, can you see it in your own childhood? Yeah, definitely. I think as soon as I entered school, it was noticeable. And even as a child and when I started school, I saw that there are certain differences. And obviously as a child, I didn't really understand it, but it was from just sitting still in class, um, not moving around. I always play this game in class <laughs> to see like if I can sit as still as the person in front of me which <laughs> I never won, <laughs> or just not listening in class, daydreaming, uh, living in my own head and in my own world and just having a hard time following the teacher. And that was kind of the how it was always in school. I didn't really enjoy school due to that. I had okay grades. I got through school, but it wasn't anything that I was particularly excited about. It's super interesting because I've had roughly 50-50 male to female ratio guests on the podcast so far. And I always ask that question to begin with. And I think pretty much all of the women have said similar. In fact, the, the, the phrase daydreamer, mm. daydreaming is something, is a word that's cropped up, I think with everyone. Um, which is, do you see women showing, displaying, manifesting ADHD in, in a different way to men, to males? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, and also most of my clients who are women who have ADHD, they all also tell me similar stories on how they first noticed that they're maybe different, but it was always 
as you said, kind of the daydreamer, or maybe they were more chatty, but it wasn't seen as hyperactive. Do you think it's the hyperactivity can happen internally and it can happen in the head, in someone's mind? Yeah, definitely. And that's something I think still to this day that we or a lot of people still don't really understand that hyperactivity doesn't mean that someone has to run around constantly or has to get up constantly. Someone might fidget or they have million thoughts racing through their head and that can all be hyperactive or like being super chatty. That can also be a type of hyperactivity, but people often miss it because when they think of hyperactivity, they just think of that kid running around in class. I'm sure that I relate to to, to everything you just said. I have, I've never been physically hyperactive. I've never been someone who bounces off the walls or is running all over the place. I, I can see mine has always been in my head. And do you find that that internalized hyperactivity can turn into anxiety? I think it's not necessarily the internalized hyperactivity. It's just you might see yourself as different or you're kind of hiding your struggles and then internalizing a lot of these struggles. And that can cause a lot of self-doubt and then that can lead to anxiety. And again, that's most of my clients that I work with have either huge self-esteem issues or have anxiety. And it's also the most common comorbid disorder uh, with ADHD. I saw a frightening statistic that people with ADHD are exposed to however many hundreds or thousands extra negative comments in their childhood. And I suppose it's what came first, the chicken or the egg. Is it, does the low self-esteem come because of that exposure to negative comments or do the negative comments come because they are there's a low self-esteem issue there originally? From what I've seen, from my personal experience, from um, my nephews who also have ADHD or from the people that I've worked with, I think it's their ADHD symptoms or them acting different than they get these negative comments from either classmates or from their teacher and then that causes them to have self-esteem issues. And that's why ADHD treatment is so important because that can really counteract the self-esteem issues and then hopefully will not lead to anxiety or anything worse. With the the, the differentiation between how it can show up in men and women, is is there a medical chemical thing that's going on there? Or do you think it's something to do with women, girls thinking that they can't act out because of like a societal societal expectation of how they should behave. So the brain and also the chemicals in the brain are the same as like in males or females. That doesn't matter. Um, It's really from the research that I've read, from the research that I have conducted, and also just from interacting with all these individuals who have ADHD, I really think it's these societal stigmas that cause women to mask more or to show their symptoms differently or to internalize a lot of these struggles way more than maybe uh, males would do. And also for women, the average diagnostic age is late 30s, early 40s, versus for men, it's uh, the average is seven years. And that just shows how unnoticed ADHD is in women. I think it's a massive problem. And you see, from just my observations, you see women when they eventually get the diagnosis that they almost don't, they've been masking so long, they don't know who the, who they are mm-hmm. anymore. Is that something you see in your client base? Yeah, again, definitely. It's also once they get the diagnosis, Right, I think everyone goes through these different waves of emotions. But for a lot of the women that I work with who received such a late diagnosis, even in their, uh, I think my oldest client, she was like 
um, 69 and she just received her diagnosis. And then there's so much also grief going on about just having missed life in a way because you were struggling so much more than you should have because with ADHD treatment, you can just live a better life. And when you just receive your diagnosis so late, then you don't really know what is ADHD, what's your personality. If you like work on your ADHD, will that change your personality? I see that in just the struggle in a lot of my clients. You were 26, I believe, when you got your diagnosis? Yeah, that's correct. So I suppose what led you to seek an assessment? Was there a moment where you just thought, wow, I might have ADHD? Mm -hmm. So I feel like at least since entering high school, I always suspected that I have ADHD, but because I wasn't really fitting the typical ADHD picture, I was a bit unsure, so I never really pursued it. And then I once I started uni and I also started to learn more about ADHD, I actually wanted to get a diagnosis, but I was living in the UK at that time and the wait times are just so long, so I <laughs> gave up. And then when I started my PhD, I was uh, working with a lot of ADHDers and doing a lot of cognitive testing. And then I was also doing a test that's called Go No Go test, and that's for measuring uh, the response inhibition. So basically how impulsive you are. And because I had to program the test and test it out, I did the test many, many times and <laughs> I just failed it so many times and I was having such a hard time with the test. And that was really like the, I guess the lightning bulb went off in my head and was like, okay, I think I really do have ADHD. And then I, of course, did all the research around ADHD and did the kind of testing myself just to see if I might be correct. And then I went to see a psychiatrist to get the official diagnosis. When the psychiatrist said that you have ADHD, and how did you feel in that moment? It was really a relief because I knew at that moment that it was ADHD and that it wasn't anything else. And for me, it's always very important to have an understanding of things. So I knew I was doing certain things differently than my peers or certain things were just harder for me. And I always ask myself, why is that? Why is that so much harder? And once I got the diagnosis, I finally had an answer to all these questions. And that was such a relief. Do you think the, the validation that a, a diagnosis gets gives you regardless of age, I suppose, as you said really clearly, you know, it, it gives you an explanation as to why you might struggle in certain situations, but also why you might be able to excel in situations where other people struggle. Like, do you think that validation eases the mental health effects of undiagnosed ADHD? I think so, because once you have an answer, or once you kind of know where all of that comes from, you can work on it. And if you don't have a diagnosis, it's so hard for people to kind of know what to do and they constantly question themselves, their intelligence or if they're lazy. And then once they have that validation, they just know why certain things are happening and then they can get the help that they so desperately need. With, with your clients, when they come to you as a ADHD coach, is there a recurring question or recurring issue that they ask help for? For, I think like most of my clients, it's sometimes it still surprises me to this day how similar the stories are and what they struggle with. So it's obviously all these executive functioning challenges like time management, organization, tackling bigger projects, but then it's also um, often emotional regulation. So they often have anger outbursts that they can't control and it just feels like they're out of control or then they suddenly go into very low mood or feel very burned out. 
And that's what I observe in most of my clients. And for the emotional regulation part, that's especially something that I see in my clients who are female. The emotional dysregulation is, I mean, it's something I relate to a lot. Mm -hmm. Is there... Why why is it such a prominent trait amongst the the, the community? Is there like a, a specific, is it a knock-on effect of a combination of things? So for the anger outbursts, it's because our frontal lobe is not as developed as in a non-ADHD brain. So we have a hard time just regulation regulating our emotions in general. And then it's also... We or many ADHDers years go from very like hyper focus mode from being super productive from doing 10 projects at one time and then that's not sustainable and then they fall off and then they go into these very low moods or like burnout and then it's usually kind of like a cycle it goes from like being hyperactive then being very depressed or in a low mood. So these are the reasons that cause these dysregulations. The, is, is there a solution? Is there some way to maintain a more consistent working pattern? Or is it more about acceptance and not being so hard on yourself? I think there is a way to get better at it. At least for me, especially then after receiving my diagnosis, that got so much better because I was able to notice the signs of when I was working too much and overworking, doing too many projects, saying yes to everything. And since working on that, it has gotten so much better. And that's what I also work on with a lot of my clients. It's just seeing how much they can actually do and noticing certain signs or symptoms when they're being overworked and then stepping down a bit so that they're more in a constant like balance and not always going from these highs highs to lows i think it's super helpful um you you mentioned it there briefly i think i have a habit and i think it's probably the people pleasing element of taking on too much and saying yes to too many things um and i think i'm getting better at that and and that's that's really helping me steer around burnout or at least mm-hmm. not go full speed into it because suddenly I've got five commitments to deliver in one day because I've said yes to too much and and then the overwhelm and the anxiety and the feeling of a potential confrontation because you're going to have to let someone down so I think what you said is it's super helpful like do you have any and I guess it's easier said than done because saying saying say yes to less things i think is really good advice but for me it goes deeper than that because there's there's quite a big people pleasing element at play which makes saying no quite hard and actually it it can be quite anxious for me to to say no to someone mm-hmm. is, do you is that a, a problem that clients come to you with mhm again it's more what i see in people who got a later diagnosis Um, I see more of these people pleasing symptoms, I guess, and saying yes to everything because when you were like later diagnosed or for most people, they were always struggling, but kind of trying to keep like on top of things. So then that adds just to the people pleasing because they're like, I want to do better. I want to make everyone happy. So if that's the issue, like if the issue to saying yes to everything comes from the people pleasing, then it's really important to work on that and kind of working on maybe mindfulness, working on your own confidence to know that you can say no to someone and they will still to like you, they will still love you and think that you're a great person. And then for some people, it's also the impulsivity that causes them to say yes, because then we get so excited about maybe a new project and we're like, yes, we want to do it. And then another one comes on and sounds also exciting. We say yes, just out of impulsiveness. So. If that's the cause, then it's also important to work on the impulsiveness of that. 
That's so relatable because, you know, I, th I think literally just two weeks ago, I had a friend come to me with a business idea and I I said to him, and I was really excited and I was ready to go right by that domain, let's do this. And I said to him, I sort of have this two week grace period now where I don't mm -hmm. commit to something when I'm in this moment of excitement because I'm, I've got enough self-awareness now to know that that probably won't last. And then it's a whole new world of anxiety and feeling bad because I have to then let that person down. Um, so yeah, what you said rings so true. Um, that impulsivity that is caused, I think, by that initial excitement, sometimes don't give in to that. I really try and allow some time between the initial thing, the seed that has caused my impulsivity to go, right, go, 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 and taking action. And it's easier said than done. I appreciate that. But yeah, just you saying that really reminded me of a coping mechanism that I kind of use now yeah. and that really helps yeah it's great that you use it and um sometimes we start implementing these coping mechanisms and then we don't even realize why or that we're using it and for what reason we're using it so sometimes when then someone mentions something then like we realize oh it's probably because of my impulsivity or uh, whatever it might be definitely and i'm always so pleased actually when i did leave that grace period because two weeks goes past and my interest is no longer there and I now don't have to call them or text them and saying sorry Jim I actually don't want to do that with you anymore um no super interesting rejection sensitive dysphoria and I guess that's kind of linked because that for me in the past has been a motivating factor to saying yes because I don't want to in my head let someone down which could potentially in my head be a rejection from them is, mm -hmm. is rsd rejection sensitive dysphoria is that a, a, an issue that clients come to you with mm -hmm. yeah again i see mostly in women or in general adhds who were later diagnosed in life so again similar to you and um it's definitely a huge struggle because that feeling that RSD gives you is it's just awful, right? So we often then tend to again overwork ourselves or say yes to too many projects or obligations. Is RSD something you've personally experienced yourself? Mm -hmm. Yes, and again my diagnosis really helped me with that and then just adhd treatment and having again a better understanding of myself of adhd that really helped me to just love myself more and then through that that really helped with my rsd i think for me rsd is probably the the most annoying part of adhd i think there are many benefits and there are many struggles but for me rsd is probably the one that gets in the way of my day-to-day -day life the most is there almost rage and that seeing red and that executive dysfunction and that in that moment you 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 just lose your ability to think straight or, or at least i do is there like a scientific explanation as to what causes such a reaction to a criticism or a rejection? I think it's a lot of things kind of playing into each other. It's firstly, again, that our brain is just a bit differently to a non adhd year. It's then that we often have anxiety or self-esteem issues that just make rejection so much harder. And then it can also be our impulsivity that makes us react in the moment or makes us overreact in the moment and it's just so hard to control that and it can take a while for us if we're getting treatment and if we're working on that to kind of get a hand on it and like i've worked on that myself for years and it has gotten better and better but obviously there are always moments when i feel like i can't control it or it's just kind of RSD or um, my emotional dysregulation is just taking over. It's super interesting and thanks for sharing that. You said you're working on it and you've seen some benefits. Is there 
anything you could share that might plant a seed in, in the listeners as to how they might be able to work with theirs? So for me, what was very helpful is to observe these outbursts or observe when I feel hurt by rejection or I think I was rejected um, and seeing the symptoms and then noticing them and becoming more aware of them. And then also doing something in the moment, maybe something distracting or uh, biting into, for example, something sour, because that will take your mind off it. And we can usually really just focus on at the moment on one thing at a time. So just these distractions or like putting your head into cold water, if that's a possibility, or like just putting cold water onto your hands can be very helpful or leaving the situation, going outside, um, listening to your favorite song. All of these things can be very helpful. And as I said, I've been working on that myself for a long time. So it just takes time and you will kind of learn what will work best for you personally. And the more you practice it, the better it will also get. That's super useful. And I'm definitely getting better at it. I think back to the problems that it's caused when I haven't taken a step back and I've reacted in the moment and I've said something that I later regret. And it's when I'm in that moment of reaction from, Mm -hmm. as you alluded to, you know, it might not even be a, a real criticism. It could just be one that you've perceived. And later on, when you've calmed down, or I can only speak for myself, it, you look back on the situation and nine times out of 10, you were being irrational. Super interesting. Relationships, I can see where RSD can cause problems, perhaps. Do you think relationships adds an extra layer of, of difficulty when RSD is put into the mix? Yeah, that's why many ADHDers have such difficulties with Um, relationships in general, if it's friends, if it's family, if it's a partner, that can really complicate things. Um, I mean, a lot of the ADHD symptoms can complicate relationships, but then also just RSD because we then perceive maybe a rejection or we get hurt if someone doesn't text us back immediately or someone says something and we take it the wrong way. So that can really have an impact on relationships. And that's, again, why working on that can be so important because it, I feel like in general, mental health or mental health disorders can have really a ripple effect on all aspects of life and also on the people around you. So it's really important that when you work on your mental health, on your ADHD or RSD, that this will also not only support you, but then also the people around you. Do you have any advice for somebody who might have ADHD or they might be in a relationship with someone with ADHD or they might both have ADHD? Um, Any advice for people to sustain and to really nurture a relationship where ADHD is involved? I think it's very important that both people in that relationship have a good understanding of ADHD. So not only the person who has ADHD, but also the partner who maybe doesn't have ADHD, just for them to have an understanding of why the person might react in a certain way or why certain things are so important for that person or certain things are just harder. Because once you have that knowledge and understanding, you can more easily understand these things and then maybe work through things. And then for the person who has ADHD or if both people have ADHD, I really think ADHD treatment is very, very important just not only for you to have a better life, but also for you to have a good partnership. And then, um, for example, if you live together and you have to do certain chores, it can be important to really talk about it, to see maybe where, what 
chore would you enjoy more? What chore could you allocate to the other person? And just always check in with each other to see if that's okay, if you could change anything, if the person needs your support, maybe it's a more, the week has been tough. And then you can just um, check in and see if you can support the person even more. And just so in general, it's just a good communication and understanding. I think it's such good advice. I think to have that awareness within the relationship. So when one partner or maybe both zones out of the conversation or is hyper-focusing on something, therefore ignoring their partner or a number of other things that if there wasn't the understanding of ADHD, you can see how that might cause an argument or mm-hmm. make one of the person in the relationship feel like they're being neglected. So I think, yeah, super good advice to communicate and to have that awareness because, and also do you think just like adding humor into it, if you can, helps? Yeah, definitely. I feel like, especially as we get older, we often forget just including humor in things. And for ADHDers, no matter where, I feel like it's so important that we include like fun aspects or humor. Um, so not only in relationships, but also just in maybe mundane tasks that you have to do. You mentioned a minute ago, you said getting treated, treatment for ADHD mm-hmm. is super important. And what do you, what do you mean by treatment? So treatment can be really anything that helps you with your ADHD. So it could be medication, it could be therapy, it could be coaching, it could be community support, could also be a combination approach of all of these or some of these. So I would say the most common are medication and coaching or medication and therapy. And I personally think whatever treatment route you choose, that's totally up to you and maybe what works best for you. But I think in general, it's just so important that we get treatment because for people who or for ADHD years who don't get treatment, their life expectancy decreases by like 12 to 14 years. So that's quite a lot. And that's why we see so many undiagnosed ADHD years or untreated ADHD years in substance abuse clinics or uh, ADHD years maybe being in a driving accident because they weren't paying attention or they were doing too many things at once. So I think whatever treatment you choose, that's good by just getting help. That's really important. That's shocking, isn't it? That statistic of, mm-hmm. I think you said 15 years. I, I, I did... I had read similar and it shocked me when I first read it. And is that, is that why then it's just lifestyle choices that might lead to an accident or health issues? Mm -hmm. So it's often could be like uh, drug abuse issues or substance abuse issues. Um, Could be accidents because we do something without thinking about it or being impulsive but it can also be health issues. So like severe stress, many ADHDers also struggle with eating disorders, whatever um, way it might be. It might be, uh, for example, binge eating. So not, or not getting just the best or not consuming the best nutritional uh, foods, not having a balanced lifestyle or diet. So all of these aspects play into that. I interviewed um, a man last week who has who's been sober for four and a half years, but he was a active alcoholic for forty years. And I've had many guests on who have had alcohol abuse issues or substance abuse mm-hmm. issues or eating issues. So it's just from my observation from running this podcast for four months so far. There's a clear from what I can see, and maybe I've just brought on guests who have had a, an issue in the past, but there seems to be a clear link between ADHD and and or undiagnosed ADHD and reaching for dopamine in like unhealthy ways to sort of fill that stimulation void that ADHD might give you 
is substance abuse, alcoholism, drug abuse, is that something that your clients come to you, you with? Mm -hmm. So I also work with um, treatment clinics together who first treat then the substance abuse. And then after that, they come to me for ADHD treatment. And so many of my clients had whatever substance abuse it might have been, uh, but struggled with that. Most common question I get into my inbox is advice for ADHD medication. And I've, I've never taken medication for ADHD. So it's always something that I'm unable to answer. I was hoping you might be able to shed a little bit of light on it and without obviously not giving out any medical advice. But do you find from the, your experience with your clients that experiences of ADHD pre-medication and post taking medication is, is vastly different and better? I would say it really depends on the person. For some individuals, medication works amazing and they see great effects. For others, it might take a while to find the right medication, to find the right dosage, to kind of find a good time to take it. So it really depends from person to person. And it can also be a long journey to find then the right medication. What I've seen has worked very well for many of my clients is having the medication, but only taking it when they feel like they really need it. But that obviously also just depends on your life circumstances, maybe also on your job or if you're still in school. But I would say it's a trial and error and doesn't necessarily work well for everyone. Just in like the briefest of explanations, how does ADHD medication work? We basically have not enough dopamine in our brain or, or it's also taken then up too quickly and then metabolized too quickly. And medication helps us to for the dopamine to stay longer in our brain. So we have more of it. And then depending on the type of medication you take, so for methylphenidate, that's like Ritalin, for example, that would make the dopamine stay in your brain for longer. And then for Adderall, for example, that will make the dopamine stay in your brain for longer, but it will also help you produce more dopamine. Yeah, I've, I've never taken ADHD medication. It's something I'm considering. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a question that I get the most in, into my inbox, but I, I've never been able to answer it. Um, but I have spoken to a lot of people who've said that it's changed their life. Um, so that's normally what I say. I say that I, I don't have any experience with it, but I have spoken to a lot of people who have really good experiences with it. Is that something that you see from your clients that they're generally happier or more productive with the medication? Mm -hmm. So I'd say like 50% of my clients take the ADHD medication regularly. And then there are maybe 20% of my clients who take the medication whenever they need it. And I feel like for the people who take it regularly, they kind of need it in the day-to-day -day life and they see the support. And when they don't take it, they obviously have a much harder time. And then for the people who take it now and then, when they take it, they really see a positive effect, but maybe the side effects don't really, or makes it not appealing to them to take the medication all the time. What are some of the, I suppose, negative side effects of ADHD medication that somebody listening, considering options might be aware of? So, because it's a stimulant medication, it reduces your appetite so it might be very hard for you to eat throughout the day and that again depends kind of on the medication or the half-life of the medication so how long it will stay in your system for some medication it will only stay in your system for like four hours and then you might be able to eat after that for others the half-life is like 10 hours so that really can throw off your eating schedule will make that just so much more challenging. It can also increase your heart rate. And for some people, 
when they then exercise with the medication still in their system, it can feel very, I guess, off, can have a weird feeling because when you exercise, your heart rate will increase even more. Um, it can also, once it starts wearing off, it can be a, produce a bit of a like jitteriness. And because it's also just very difficult to find the right dosage, that can make these symptoms even worse. So like if you if your dosage is too low or too high, you can just feel very jittery even throughout taking the dosage and not just when it's wearing off. I mean, a lot of the stuff you said there reminds me of my experience with something not so powerful, coffee, caffeine. Um, mm -hmm. And I probably drink coffee subconsciously to help me focus. Um, I drink a fair amount of coffee and it has a lot of those side effects. I try and stop drinking at a particular time of the day so I can sleep. Do you find that caffeine is beneficial to ADHD traits? So because caffeine is also a stimulant, it can have like a mild effect on like ADHD medication. So it can help you to be more calm and be more concentrated. So that's why they, again, like you subconsciously, a lot of ADHDers years um, kind of use that as a I guess treatment method because uh, it can really help you to just be more focused, be more calm, be more present, especially for ADHDers. years. It's always aware of maybe how they consume certain things or how they do certain things. And it's important to maybe note down if it's getting a bit excessive to kind of try to stay somewhat balanced in all aspects of life, whether that's exercise, whether that's drinking coffee. And I think just being aware of it is very beneficial and helpful and also important so that we don't kind of maybe drift off into anything that's too excessive. Before I came on today, I put a post out on to my community asking if what topics they wanted me to ask you about. And one that came in frequently was imposter syndrome and what can be done to try and make people feel more confident in their own skin. So I suppose the question is, is imposter syndrome something that your clients come to you with? And what advice do you give to anyone who might be feeling that effect? So I think the imposter syndrome kind of fits into the whole um, low confidence, uh, RSD, anxiety, overthinking section. It's because we maybe had to mask for so many years of our life that we don't really know what we're capable of or we kind of dismiss it and we just focus on the mistakes we made because we got reminded of all those mistakes so many times in our, I feel like especially school life or even work life. So it's really important that if you struggle with imposter syndrome that you start to learn to love yourself and that can be through really different, very different avenues. So it could be therapy, could be coaching, it could be mindfulness techniques, could be um, starting like a gratitude journal or writing down the things that you achieved during the day. So kind of doing uh, a reverse to-do list, seeing that you did accomplish something today and that that was amazing and that you don't always have to give 112%. Like you don't always have to overachieve what I think many of us feel like we need to do. Yeah, it's amazing. I think just the, doing the little things like you said can actually really be beneficial to your self-esteem. And it also gives you evidence of your achievements because I forget sometimes things I do and I might do something that might be evidence of my ability like if I talk on stage or if I do a particular piece of work or I do this podcast it's that's evidence of me being able to do something productive but then I can forget mm -hmm. that memory I can forget that experience so so when I need to do it again I don't have anything to think back on so I mm -hmm. think that I can't do it so 
and then I get on stage or I do the podcast and I, or I do another bit of work and, and time and time again, I can do it because my skill sets, as with everyone, are built in. I'm sure you can forget them over time, but in the, in the medium term, generally, you're not going to forget how to ride a bike or you're not going to forget how to talk on stage or you're not going to forget how to take a coaching class. But you might forget that you know how to do it, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I also think it's a negativity bias that we usually can think of all the negative things that happen to us and we really hyper focus on that. And then just for, as you said, forget all the things that we achieved or the positive things that happened during the day or the week. It's really important that we try to focus on our achievements and that we are more positive and are more accepting of ourselves and not always doubt ourselves. We mentioned masking briefly earlier and just to touch on finally because it's a topic that I'm fascinated by. Do you think that you have masked in the past? Definitely because I feel like in school especially because I didn't know that I have ADHD I tried to fit in try to do things as my peers did and it was very hard to kind of put yourself into their um, or mask them or uh, uh, copy their behavior I mean so and I think that can then really impact your self-esteem because then you don't really know who you are because you're always trying to copy someone else's behaviors someone else's patterns and that can really have an impact on your confidence you've explained that so well and someone in a previous episode referred to it as mirroring mirroring mm -hmm. someone else's behavior like you 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 even copy their accent their tone of voice you copy their body posture and i i used to do that and i still do it now sometimes that like subconscious part that causes it is quite deeply embedded but i'm more aware of it now i used to do it all the time and not be aware of it i used to if i had hung around a particular group of friends i would speak less posh <laughs> i would drop mm -hmm. my t's and sometimes someone who i was with who you know was a school friend would be like alex why are you speaking like that that's not what you speak like um and i guess that is a confident do you think that's a confidence thing is you just you haven't got that confidence in that moment to be who you really are mm -hmm. yeah i really do think so yeah and it's fascinating do you think you still mask i think in certain um aspects i definitely still mask um i always try to be observant of my behaviors and kind of catch myself when I do it but because I've been doing it for most of my life or for most of my life I didn't know that I actually have ADHD so obviously it's very hard to unlearn and it's going to take time to truly be yourself and truly show yourself. Do you think you know who you are? I think so. It's yeah. definitely, I feel um, there are always moments when you doubt yourself and you're kind of unsure maybe who you are, what you're doing, what's your passion when you just start questioning everything. But for the most part, uh, I really now know who I am and I have accepted also who I am and appreciate what I've done and who I've become. Just finally, do you think there's any advice for somebody who might be listening who is going through that process of realizing that they have been masking for so long and they're figuring out who is under the mask and who is their true self? Do you think there's any advice for someone in that moment in their life where they're going through that process of self-discovery? Most important thing is I think that you have to be kind to yourself and learn to love yourself and learn to love yourself for who you are and not for who you kind of want to be if that like who you're copying or why you're masking so really being kind to yourself accepting who you truly are and also knowing that it will probably take some time to also for you to have an understanding of who you really are and what's important to you. Mm. 
Yeah, no, that's fascinating. And thanks for sharing that. I think that actually will be really good advice because I think there are a lot of people, especially now with this prevalence and prominence of awareness around ADHD and autism and this, a lot of people are coming to terms with with perhaps that for a long time they have been masking and now they're realizing and, and going through that journey of self-discovery. So thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for your time today, Dr. Yanina. Where can people find you if they want to follow your content or learn more about you? So they can find me on Instagram under ADHD, um, what is it called, lower dash? I will put it in the show notes. <laughs> okay. like I'm not sure I haven't got it to hand. <laughs> so it's ADHD Empowerment Coaching. And then also my website is ADHDEmpowermentCoaching.com. Amazing. I'll put all of that in the show notes for people to find. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on here. It was so much fun. Oh, 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 oh,